uh, what year was it that you had the privilege of standing on top of the podium or on the podium? You got a silver medal. Yes, it was 2012 in London. 2012 in London. Now, here's something I've always wondered. We were talking about the best of the best of the best athletes, yeah. right? And so you, you clearly you fall into that category. When did you really start to ramp up your training leading up to that? You know, because I'm thinking like MMA, there's a, as we, um, Conor McGregor just fought. So you hear about like an MMA yeah. fighter. And so they really don't start training until a month or two out. Right. And I assume that looking at their nutrition, that really doesn't start until that time either. How far out were you when you really started to kick things into high gear? Well, now that you've shared that with me about the MMA fighters, I feel like I'd rather be an MMA fighter if they're not training in between <laughs> fights, because I think they probably are. But that really serious high density focus is I think what you're talking about. But I mean, quite honestly, it you know, it was it was a it was a thirteen year career. There there was there was never a time when I wasn't highly focused on uh, you know, the next, the next battle, the next race, the next world championships, because all of those were the building blocks to make it to the Olympic team. So, you know, the, you know, you're, you're starting to qualify the country, your, your own country spot. A lot of people don't know that. Like it's not, you're not necessarily qualifying. You're going to the Olympics. You have to qualify your country spot. And then the country itself will select the athletes that will fill that spot. So we started that process, um, qualifying the United States in our discipline on the track um, a year and a half before, you know, so I, I guess you could kind of say that's when it really comes into your your focused sphere of this is happening, you know, that, that we are going to the Olympics and I could be one of the athletes. But yeah, as a professional athlete, it's you're never really, you know, cruising. To, for a very long time, you know, you, you take some time off, right, in, in the off season, but uh, your, your feet are never really up for too long. Sure. And and that's not to say, I just use Conor McGregor as an example. That's not to say that they're not always, you know, working on their fitness and, and trying to be healthy. I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know, like camp, right? So they have this camp that mm -hmm. they go to, and that's usually a month or two ahead of time. And that's when they really get that hyper-focused, you know, just yeah. training sessions in and and kick things into high gear but i mean if if you're doing that from 18 months out i mean good god almighty i mean you, you got some endurance there dotsy well so you know the the mental aspect i think maybe is even more what you're talking about that hyper focus so i hear you now like you're not you're not in that realm for 18 straight months physically you are right because you're building 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 so you're you're tearing down and then you're repairing and you're getting stronger tearing down and that never stops but the mental aspect of that you know you i worked on it really hard for like maybe the last five years of my career uh with a sports psychologist but you we went to Mallorca, Spain, the, the, the US team, so that we could be on the same time zone as London. Uh, Mallorca also provides incredible uh, road cycling and they have a great track there. So we spent three, a little over three months there as a team uh, before heading over to London. So that kind of was our like that, you know, that camp prep that you're talking about where literally every minute of every day is built around those two days in London like everything you're doing, everything you're eating, your entire experience. And it's, it's intense. It's, it was very intense, but it was, it was also wonderful. I'll, I'll bet. I mean, an experience like no other, an experience of a lifetime, but we can't have this here <laughs> interview without talking about the food that you, you guys were eating. Uh, what was the typical menu like uh, for the team at that point? Well, my menu was a little different than of course. the teammates' menus. Of course. Um, although they 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 leaned into it quite a bit more cool. as, as we you know just just a lot more you know plants on their plate because that's never a bad thing, right? Never. Um, yeah. So it was somewhat challenging in my work in Spain. My husband and I are getting ready to go back for a vacation in, in like a month and we can't wait to see what's changed and if there's more vegan options and, and maybe even some vegan restaurants. But uh, a typical 
typical meals for me were um, really still hair, how I still eat today. You know, it's like, a, I like to make these huge Buddha bowls in the Game Changers film. I called them trough bowls because I ate a lot of food back then. You know, just, they were really large. I'm holding my hands up like I'm holding a, a monster bowl, but it was like grains and greens and beans, legumes and seeds and nuts. and. Um, you know, a wonderful dressing. Maybe I would do some, you know, chopped up field roast sausages or some stir fried tofu on there, but not always. I, I don't, I'm not somebody who's like, I have to have a meat replacement on there. You know, a lot of times I just would love the garbanzo beans, kidney beans, black beans, whatever it might be. And that was really easy to access because we had this absolutely phenomenal, gorgeous farmer's market. We stayed in Alaro, Spain and our balcony overlooked the Alero town square and every Saturday they had this farmer's market that just blew my mind. I've never been to a farmer's like it in, in the U.S. And as, as a lot of people know, the, the, the vegetables just taste different. I, you know, they're just not as, they haven't gone through as many processes and they don't spray as much crap on them over <laughs> in Europe. So it, it just, everything basically was organic, you know, without, without saying it. So we would go every Saturday and just load up and, and it, it was just a lot of color um, and, and, a, and a lot of food in general. <laughs> Get a, well, yeah, it's got to be a lot of food if you're going to the trough, not just sitting down at the yeah. table. You're going to the trough. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, here's one. A lot of athletes, when they first get the we, they first have a conversation about eating plant-based one of the things that they worry about well there's no way i'm going to get enough calories and i would imagine that when you're training when you're in camp leading up to the games like you're probably taking in more than the typical 2000 calories a day was that difficult for you mm -hmm. to get to that number of calories that you needed knowing that you were eating a more nutrient dense uh diet than what some would say was calorically dense. How did you find that mm -hmm. balance? Yeah, quite honestly, I found it difficult even before I was plant-based, yeah. uh, you know, so I, I was needing to take in four to 4,500 calories. I mean, it was, I was burning five easily, sometimes more. So, you know, I needed to stay the same weight. And so sometimes I, I you know, I had to, had to match it, right? So it was up, upwards of 5,000, 5,500 calories, which is a lot of food and yes, it it, it it required more food uh, as as a as a plant based athlete. So, I mean, now I don't feel that way at all. Like I love food, and when people tell me, "Oh, I couldn't go plant based. I'm a foodie," it's like, "Oh, well, you get to eat like three times as much food. So if you're a foodie, plant based is for you because you get to, you know, really you get to have more volume." But uh, you know, back then, yes, I we used to call it force feeding. It just was too much food to, to, for, to really ever sit down and enjoy a meal. Um, you know, and, and you have to think about the, the, the cost uh, analysis of your digestion too, right? Because that takes energy and effort away from your uh, body repairing and replenishing its muscle and its muscle fibers uh, and, and, and lung tissue and, and everything. So uh, the one thing that I felt so much better on a plant-based diet was my digestion. You know, I didn't, I never felt like I was, um, I never felt bloated. I never felt lethargic. I never felt heavy. I never felt like, oh gosh, I gotta take a nap to digest my meal. So that, that was a really cool difference, even though I was eating a bit more volume. Um, I just felt springy and able to just, you know, go for a walk or go for a recovery bike ride within, you know, 20, 30 minutes after, after eating a really, really large meal. And that was never the case with meat and dairy. Oh, that's great. We're going to talk about that in depth in just a second. I mean, we're, we're going to go, we're going to go ham on uh, pardon the pun. We're going to go ham on dairy. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. But I'm curious. So you're talking about this nice farmer's market that you had access to in Spain, but what about when you actually got to the Olympic village in London? Um, speaking in the past to Megan Duhamel, she was telling me about how it was sponsored by McDonald's. And basically, if you were a participant in the games, you could go and get a Big Mac 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as the games were going on. What was the situation like for you in London? Yeah, it is super bizarre. There is a McDonald's inside of the athlete eating hall, inside of it. And it's pretty humorous a little in terms of the beginning of the games, like the first couple of days I was there, I, I got there 
I went to opening ceremonies, so I was there at the beginning. Mostly the line for McDonald's is filled with um, like coaches and trainers and mechanics and that. You're like, there's no athletes. Like they, every, at least athletes have gotten a memo, like maybe no McDonald's, the high performance diet, they're, they're not the same thing. But as the games would, um, were unfolding, you could tell the athletes that were finished with their events were in line. <laughs> Uh, for for McDonald's, even my teammates, I'll have to say that that night after our medal ceremony and all the interviews, everything, and we finally wound down and we were starving. We we're like, we're going to McDonald's. I was like, you guys really, really, that's really where you're, what we're gonna do right now. But you know, it was the whole. So, but I will say, in London, uh, they did a phenomenal job with the rest of the food. Even though there was a McDonald's in the center, they had it. Uh, separated in categories by uh, regions of the world. So it, it was just beautiful. I mean, so basically any athlete from any part of the world could go to their section of the world and get food that agrees with them, that, that they were already used to, that their system was already used to eating. So I just thought that was lovely and so inclusive and a beautiful thing to do. And, but it also, you know, for us Americans that you know, we we love to either eat, you know, Asian food or, you know, East Indian food or, or you know, uh, Spanish food or whatever it might be. It was quite fun because you could, go to, you know, go to all the different sections and they had plant based options at every every single section of the world. I mean, it was unbelievable. I had no idea it was going to be that good. It, it, I, I could eat there every day. I was so sad when it was over. That it was, sounds amazing. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. You know, <laughs> but hold on back to the McDonald's. I think one of the things Megan said that made me laugh, she was like, the only athletes that we really saw in the McDonald's before their competition were curlers. Curlers <laughs> didn't seem to matter so much for them. Of course, she's doing the Winter Olympics, and that made all the sense in the world to me. I just thought that that was fantastic. Um, <laughs> fantastically funny. Anyway. Yeah, right. Um, Let's uh, let's let's go ham on dairy now, shall we? Uh, let's take a take a few minutes and talk about milk. Why not? Um, you see a lot of these Olympians doing ads promoting milk, right? And so McDonald's, they're a big sponsor there. You can get that pretty readily. Was milk all over the place there as well? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I mean, you know, you had access to every dairy product that you could think of. You know, there was plenty of ice cream and there was plenty of yogurt and there was cheese options on everything. And there was, you know, milk and chocolate milk. I mean, it was, it was readily available. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about chocolate milk. This is a claim that just it, it always seemed bizarre to me, even before I became interested in health and nutrition. The yeah. chocolate milk myth, as far as helping your muscles recover after a workout, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. It's milk, but then you dump a whole bunch of sugar in it, right? So even if you don't know that milk by itself is a very sugary substance, you know that when you add a crap ton of sugar to something, it's not mm -hmm. going to be the healthiest thing in the world, yet it's being touted as the ultimate recovery drink. What, what, yeah. what is this? Help me understand. Well, here's why. And it, it, they, they, they have uh, one part of that correct. Uh, we, because there's, ton, there's, there's plenty of research surrounding that initially within the first hour after uh, really hard uh, exercise where you've torn down your muscles and, 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 you know, been training for an hour or more, that the first replenishment that you need is glycogen. Um, and then within 30 to 45 minutes after the replenishment of glycogen, because that's what starts uh, is the precipitous to muscle repair, you need to start moving in the, the protein and then some fats. So that's why they're they're leaning on it because it, what, what, yes, there are better forms of sugar than others. Of course, we know that, right? We wanna get our sugars in whole fruit sources so that we can have the fiber with it because might as well have the best, right? And not, you know, um, like a filtered apple juice, right? Where you're not gonna have the fiber. But nonetheless, it, it, you need some kind of glycogen or sugar repair to start the muscle uh, you know, recovery and synapse. So they have that right. But what is 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 crazy about all of the rest of it, and, and you talk about this, you know, plenty of times with uh, Dr. Barnard and Susan Levin with Milky White Lies, is <laughs> you have this substance 
right? That has some has some essential nutrients, right? Uh, of course it does. It's to grow a baby. So all breast milk of any mammal, right? It's, it's got some qualities and it's got some protein and some carbohydrates and some fat, right? And some nutrients uh, because it has to, but it comes in this package where with these really nasty deleterious effects to the human body right because it's 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 made for a bovine it's not made for the human body so um it it, it leads to a you know bone breakdown makes 70 percent of the world's population quite sick in the form of lactose intolerance um, it's continually linked to hormonal based cancers especially breast breast and prostate as we know you guys talk about i mean the prostate cancer risk is massive um i think the uh, International Journal of Cancer uh, did a study where um, if men consumed, the, the men that consumed three or more servings of dairy products a day had a 141% higher risk for death due to prostate cancer compared to those who had less than one serving. I mean, that's staggering. That's not like 10% more. Uh, it's, 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 it's just monstrous. And, you know, I, I think, one of the main things that uh, people are always surprised to learn is, as far as athletes go, uh, is how many athletes suffer from asthma. Uh, about 20% of the United States um, Olympic team in Atlanta in 96 has had asthma, has a had asthma. Um, don't know if they still do. If they gave up dairy, they don't have it anymore. But uh, dairy has been linked in, in, in multiple ways and multiple reviews and studies to the exacerbation of asthma. So you just have all of these issues that come with it when you could just have a creamy white glass of soy milk. And if you want to add a little sugar to it to, to for glycogen replenishment, then, you know, have at it. Yeah, man. Let me tell you something. There is nothing wrong with a good old fashioned glass of uh, I'm a mark for unsweetened almond vanilla, uh, mm -hmm. vanilla almond milk unsweetened. It's just like God's nectar to me. And I will drink two or three glasses of that a day and just be as happy as possible. Yeah. Um, the thing, though, about this, this chocolate milk thing, and, and I wanted to know where this first came from and i was able to trace it back as far as 2010 mm -hmm. it was presented the idea was at this conference in baltimore but the study itself that was being cited was funded by the national dairy council and the national fluid milk Pro process yes. promotion well, like whatever yep. that heck that is but so that um that needs to kind of like sound the alarms a little bit right so that's that's a bit of a red flag there when you know that the dairy council is behind a milk study right i mean yes yes and no in terms of the, the more that i have uh you know through doing what i do the more i dive into studies the more you realize that most of the studies that come out uh, a certain way are paid for by the people that wanted it to come out a certain way i mean that that's not unheard of it's 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 quite common but i know that study that you're talking about and if you look <laughs> under the rug at that study there's two things that are just uh resoundingly unbelievably ridiculous and it's so sad that people don't look past the abstract to really see what the issues are with the study one of the main issues is when they came out and said that chocolate milk is the ultimate recovery drink um what it was compared to in the study was a sports drink and water <laughs> so it's not even compared to a nutritionally equivalent like plant source so soy milk or maybe almond milk soy milk has more protein so they probably if they could have chosen that that would have been fair but first of all anything with calories is going to win over something with zero calories which is water like period, you know, a, a mouthful of dirt is going to win over water. <laughs> uh, Scott, you got a few calories there. Um, but then comparing it to a sports drink, you're obviously not comparing apples to apples. And people think when a study comes out, it says this is the ultimate recovery beverage because of these reasons that it's been compared to something that is equivalent. And then when you even look deeper into the study on the subjects that they used, they tested seven, that's it, not 70, not 17, seven white Irishmen. So, well, there's all sorts of issues with that, right? Like, so they obviously were hand selected to not be lactose intolerant. 
So to say this is a great recovery drink for everyone is completely unfair because it's not for the 70% of people that this substance makes sick via lactose intolerant, right? Um, it says in the study seven, uh, seven men, but we were curious and we emailed them and then that the, the PI of that study got right back to us and told he's the one that told us they were white and Irish. So then we knew they had been hand selected uh, to not, to not be lactose intolerant. Well, uh, heck, so I it's really misleading. That one, yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. That's that <laughs> selective data. All right. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for checking out the Exam Room podcast by the Physicians Committee here on Plant Based News. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcast or Spotify. Just click the links below to raise your health IQ. Um, yeah. here, here's another thing, right? So you talk about recovery. And one of the things that I've learned since doing the exam room is that when it comes to recovery, you want anti-inflammatory foods, anti-inflammatory everything, right? Mm -hmm. If your muscles are inflamed, you're not going to be able to recover nearly as well. Uh, but is dairy not inflammatory? Isn't it? Yeah, no, well, it, it, def it definitely is. I mean, yeah. so first of all, if you're lactose intolerant, but then second of all, um, the D-galactose and the NEU5GC are the two aspects of dairy that um, scientists uh, and, and physicians have told me are the most inflammatory factors. And those are, are mainly because they're not recognized by the human body. So what happens when something comes in that our body doesn't recognize, it mounts a defense system in the form of inflammation. Right. So then yeah. wouldn't that kind of go against the whole idea of uh, chocolate milk being yeah. recovery fuel? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're winning right now. Yes. Thank you. I, man, I have to win. I'm on a podcast with you, for goodness sake, <laughs> man. Uh, I got I to gotta, I gotta keep pace with you. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned on the Switch for Good website as well uh, was blood flow, right? And I would imagine that's critical for athletic performance as well, but you consume a lot of fat that comes with the dairy that's going to restrict blood flow as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Uh, over the long, like, long haul, like that's, that's really going to set you back as well, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's what's so confusing about the dietary guidelines is they have come out finally in the last you know five years, uh, really taking a pretty strong stance on how bad saturated fat is for us and how many issues it, it, it creates and causes in the human body. Yet they still promote dairy, which is uh, the biggest source of saturated fat in the American diet. So d that just doesn't align at all. So yeah. 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 <laughs> saturated fat bad. Little yeah. contradictory there. Just yeah. a little bit. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you what. You know what? You, you you brought up the Milky White Lies episode. And if you haven't heard that or if, if you haven't checked that out on YouTube yet, you really should. That's where Dr. Barnard and Susan Levin, the wonderful dietitian, and I, we went on the uh, <laughs> Dairy Board website and looked at all of their health claims, the facts about milk, is, uh, milk uh. as they put it, and, and we just fact check those facts. Um, yeah, lo lots of skewed science there. Next time mm -hmm. we do that, uh, I'm, I'm going to rope you into that because I think that you would have a field day with that. <laughs> it's depressing to go on that site, but I've been on it. And yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I don't know how they, they sleep at night. Uh, they do. Yeah. Well, yeah. No. Yeah. No, yeah. Because they, they, they know how skewed it all is. I mean, they course. know that they're, yeah. Oh, it's disgusting. I will tell you the interesting thing, though, is, um, and this is, this is a straight shot, just going off script. Some of the criticism that we receive is like, well, yeah, well, you guys do the same thing with your studies and you cherry pick the data. And I can tell you for a fact that is not happening. Uh, we give it to you straight. And a lot of the nutrition studies that you see out there that come from the supposed plant-based community, and I'm going to put that in quotes because that's what the critics do. Uh, those are straight shooting uh, studies, you know? Yeah, and, and, and you, you and I don't have anything to gain. No. Right, we're not selling anything. No. So, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, I'm not, you're not, you know, Physicians Committee and Switch for Good are a nonprofit. So we're just trying to sell the truth but we're not getting any money no matter what we're what we're going to spend if mm. we were to spend some you know so that I think you have to really kind of look behind uh you know how much money there is to be made they're selling a, a product 
Mm, that piques the reporter in me. Makes me want to go do yeah. a little investigative report and follow that <laughs> money trail. There you go. Uh, <laughs> all right. the dollar. Uh, back to the games in Tokyo. You know what I would love? I would love this so much if one of our marathon runners was eating a plant-based diet, right? Because uh. we hear so much about how vegan uh, endurance athletes just mm. perform so optimally. And I think that that would be such a home run uh, if we could get somebody on that particular team to eat a plant-based diet. I think that would be gangbusters. Yeah, I think some of the track and field, I heard snippets and smatterings of conversations about predominantly plant-based diets with some of the athletes in the 5K and 10K. But I, I yeah, I haven't heard anything for the marathon. It's, so it's, you know, we're kind of moving into an era where so many athletes are starting to get this memo and, and learning like, oh, this could actually be a performance advantage that I've, I'm fairly curious uh, to know if there's some that are just not sharing their secret. Mm, it could be. Yeah. You know, because we used to not, I mean, you know, back in the day, I didn't know that this was going to be a performance enhancer. So I wasn't quiet about it, but but now I might be. But other, way, other ways that I was training, uh, I definitely didn't share. Yeah. You know, it's like your it's it's you know, it's your little like secret toolbox of of how you're going to be better than the next. So I yeah, I I'm, I'm quite curious about that because I think it's possibly quite a bit more athletes than we know about. Got to keep that edge. Got to keep yeah. that edge. Yeah. Um and and so speaking about the number of athletes that uh, that are doing this now. Uh your your roster with the Eat Like an Olympian campaign in just a couple of minutes I'm going to ask you about that. It's a who's who and there are some gigantic names on that list. So I'm really excited about what you have cooking there. Um but before we go over there there's two more things that I want to hit. Uh, with you. One is something that you just tipped me off to right before we began this interview was what's happening with uh, this gentleman by the name of Mark Cavendish over at the Tour de France. Like this guy, this guy is really raising some eyebrows because of his story. So sell it with the same passion that you told it to me <laughs> 20 minutes ago because I was like, knock me over with a feather surprise. Yeah, because. well, it's, I it, know, it's, it, this is one of those examples of uh, you know, just, I, I don't know why it's not more of a thing. It's, it's not being talked about more in, in the mainstream media or even coming out of his own mouth, but he is a, Mark Cavendish is from Wales. He's a, so a, 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 a British cyclist and he is, uh, an, an absolutely extraordinary talent, a phenomenal sprinter was winning stages in the Tour de France uh, in the mid 2000s, you know, just collecting it like you would just dust balls, like just easy peasy. It, it looked like, of course it wasn't, but, um, and then he just started kind of, you know, falling apart or he couldn't get out of his own way. Like we like to say in cycling. So for the past, I'd say five years, maybe six, like he just was unheard of. Like no one knew where he was and, and he couldn't get on a team. And he just, you know, he, he just, he wasn't winning races. And I, I, I thought he'd retired quite frankly. Well, anyway, long story short, he, this year, in this year's tour de France, um, he is uh, on a team who is not paying him. They said, "Not, nah, we don't have a salary for you this year, you know, because he just was was really sucking sucking it up the last five or six <laughs> years. And so they didn't, you know, put any stock into it and, and didn't pay him anything. He said, no problem. I can take care of it. I don't, you know, necessarily need a salary. Um, you know, he's racing against guys who are, their salaries are one, two, five million bucks. Anyway, he came out like gangbusters and he started winning a couple of sprint stages uh and today so it's july 9th when this is in the air he uh won a stage of the tour uh which is his 34th stage win which now it's makes history because it puts him um in level with Eddie Merckx, who is really the most legendary, greatest uh, cyclist of all time. Uh, he's a Belgian cyclist back in the uh, 70s. And he won 34 stage of the Tour de France. So if Mark can pick up one more stage, you know, that, that makes history, uh, you know, 35 stages of the Tour de France. But here's what's so special. Uh, magically, miraculously, uh, about a year and a half ago, he went plant-based with his whole family. There it is. 
Yes. So he, you, you guys just have to, to Google him. He has like this um, meatless like YouTube show. He has a hotel in the UK that the um, restaurant is, I, I think, I, I want to think it's 100% vegan, but it's almost all vegan. <laughs> I don't know if it's 100%. I don't want to mis, misquote that. Um, he, his whole family went vegan. They said for uh, planet Earth, so his wife and his kids, and they they do these cooking videos, and he just he's he's really really quite open about it. Um, and I would say it's it's the key that that unlocked him uh, back to the top step of the podium. So I wish I wish NBC was chatting about his plant based diet a little bit more. But obviously, that plays a, a huge role into why he is now back on the top step. He com he completely changed his whole diet over. Oh, that's so cool. That's such a cool story. The fact that he's pedaling for free just for the love yeah. of the sport and yeah. is at the top of his game once again is just it's incredible to me and mm -hmm. uh, i i don't think that he'll be pedaling for free much longer uh no given, given <laughs> I, the results i guarantee you he is a massive contract he has signed yesterday probably even before this this win today but definitely after today for for the, i'm sure he's got a two or three year deal on the table and you know he was definitely not going to be selected by the Great Britain Olympic team prior to these wins, but now there's no way they can't take him because the, right. the the road race in Tokyo is uh, it's a little bumpy, uh, but there aren't any big climbs, and so it could very easily end in a sprint. And <laughs> that's that's the guy they want to take. Mark, get it done, Mark. <laughs> Typically, I'll root for Team USA, but I'm 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 cheering for Mark this go around. Um, and and so one more, and then we're gonna talk eat like an Olympian. But your Olympic moment, I was unaware that you were in the middle of royalty, both actual royalty <laughs> and music royalty. So talk to us a little bit about what that was like, because oh my God, Paul McCartney, that is all. I know, right? Well, you know what? I didn't know till after. Like it's, I didn't really realize what was going on during. So we um, in in London we uh, beat the Australians by eight one hundredths of a second to take us into the gold medal round. And we raced for gold against Great Britain. And like you said earlier, I have a silver. So that tells you how that went. So track cycling is just, it's just like all the rage it pretty much all through europe but especially in in uh in great britain and so it was it was standing room only it was like um my husband had to get my family's tickets um like literally on the black market it, it was it was like the hottest ticket in town and so he was like in alleyways the night before like at two in the morning <laughs> my family tickets to be able to come that's super so it was sketchy. A that's super super, sketchy. super yeah i don't know what i think he paid a lot but anyway we needed the fam fam there right so um crazy just hottest ticket and the the uh, prince and princess were there and paul mccartney was there like i said i didn't i didn't know that until like a bit a bit after uh like not before our race but uh it was just it, we, you and I were talking about the focus that you have as an athlete and, and, the, and that tunnel that you go into, you know, we call it the cave. Um, and I remember, you know, getting, uh, walking up the track to get clipped in to start that, that, that gold medal ride. And the whole track was moving. It, it was literally moving underneath me to a degree where I thought this is, I, I, I think the building that might implode, like, is this safe to, to race? Because it was so loud and they were beating the bleachers and their seats and everything in, in such a crazy, you know, they were just hysterical. So, but as an athlete, you don't really, you know, couldn't really hear the volume. I just remember staring at the crowd and thinking, this is, this is insane. But after the race, they won obviously. And, um, they started playing uh, Hey Jude, and then Paul McCartney came up on the big screens, and he was there, and he started singing it, and it was a whole British moment that we weren't <laughs> too much a part of, but it was kind of like, whoa, this is, oh my, oh, and I'm like, oh, that's cute, they they beamed in Paul McCartney, and it's like, wait a minute, that's like Section G4, he's right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, man. That that file that under that just happened. Oh 
Holy crap. Oh, uh, that's no. amazing, man. What a, what a moment. And there are going to be so many moments uh, in Tokyo as well. And eat like yeah. an Olympian. Like, I'm stoked for this. You don't have to be an athlete participating in the games to eat like an Olympian. You guys have this cooked up over at Switch for Good. Talk to us a little bit about what you have going on with that. Yeah, well, you know, the point of this is really just to have a really damn good time and win some prizes and really get a window into uh, what plant-based nutrition looks like for these Olympians that are competing in Tokyo and then many of the Olympians that have been a part of our, our work since the beginning that are retired, but, you know, three-time uh, gold medalists in soccer and, and, and whatnot. So uh, we have like a competition a challenge uh, that's a bingo board where you have to like comp complete a challenge every day. It's gonna run from opening ceremonies to closing ceremonies. So July 23rd to August 8th. Um, and it, in, if you sign up, which is super easy on switchforgood.org, it's just right on the homepage. Um, there's, a, there's all sorts of discounts to um, our amazing food partners and prizes, but also uh, really um, specific to just the people that sign up um window look into what these athletes are eating uh what they're eating to recover what they're eating pre-workout uh what they're eating at, at night before you know what what kind of you know food that is and i just want to say you don't have to eat the volume of food like i recognize when we when we plan this out i i, I had this thought of uh, eat like an Olympian, people are going to think they're going to get fat because like, <laughs> they know that we eat like, so it's, you don't have to go with the volume. It's really understanding uh, the types of plant-based foods that they're choosing at different parts in the day, depending on what their output is and what their workout looks like and helping people to really learn the power of the nutrients in plants, right? Like nitric oxide and beets. We were talking about blood flow earlier. 14% uh, increase in endurance uh, if you eat uh, a cup of beets before uh, an endurance event, exercise, whatever you want to call it. So we're, we're going to hone in on really specific nutrients as we go throughout, but you're going to be able to see the menus of, of these athletes and all the different sports that they're in, whether it's a strength-based sport or more of an endurance-based sport. So it's set up so that we just have a lot of fun and people can win a lot of cool stuff, uh, but really, really learn in the, in the process and, and how they can apply um, all that nutrition advice to their own lives to feel and better. And, and listen to me, roomies, this this is exciting and it's not small potatoes, right? This isn't some small little thing that's happening. No, 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 no. <laughs> Dotsie, you guys expect to reach like 10 million people like through your advertising campaign. So like that is an enormous goal. pool. Like, so yeah, get in on this. Like that's a fierce competition. If you're in there with 10 million people, for goodness <laughs> sakes, like, I mean, you gotta be throwing bows, like the healthiest bows possible, man. But dag on it, man, if I'm going in, I'm going going for the gold, Dotsie. I'm going for gold. Good. All right. Good. Get, get, get signed up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some, of, some of the names. So your partner Olympians, Rachel Adams, uh, bronze volleyball. Uh, you, of course, Heather Mitz, uh, three-time Olympic gold medalist in soccer. That soccer yeah. team, the women's soccer team, yeah. man, they love some plant-based eating, don't they? They do. It's like they all they talk about getting the memo. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, there's six or seven of them on the team that are plant-based. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And I, I believe if they win gold at the Olympics, it's gonna be the first team male or female in history to have won the, the, the World Cup and the Olympics in the same year quote year because because I think that, that the World Cup was at the end of 2020 if I'm not so it's within the same 12 months that's what I'm trying to say so yay go USA history yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah 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 Al Allie Riley's on the team Alex Morgan I mean we, we, Alex Morgan it doesn't get bigger than that and then you look over at basketball Sue Bird for goodness sakes Sue freaking Bird is a legendary on the basketball she is, court. and she's dairy free yeah she's not entirely vegan but she'll get there but but she is uh, very vocally dairy-free. Um, she's pro most likely lactose intolerant. I don't know, but I, most likely, and just, uh, yeah, talks quite a bit about her, her dairy-free eating, so. Oh, that's cool. That's, Go mama that's cows. Get, <laughs> get, get her, girl. <laughs> she won't be won't be recovering with the chocolate milk. No, no, Ugh, no, no, no. Gross, yeah. No. Ah. Well, daggone, you got a lot going on. I love it. Uh, how's, uh, how's the Switch for Good podcast coming? Oh, you know what? It's 
you know, it's, I just love doing it with Alexandra. Like we just love it so much. And it, it's just such a, it's such a special way to uh, reach an audience that wants and needs this information and is, is, is curious and excited about learning. And, you know, I mean, just it's so fun having all the different, all the different guests on from all different walks of life and, and, and just, you know, being exposed to all of their brilliance and suggestions to make our lives better. So it's going great. Thanks it's, for asking. <laughs> yeah, it's the coolest. And and to this day, it was one of my favorite interviews that I've ever given was when I had Ugh. the opportunity to hop on with you guys. You were phenomenal. Like was... you were one of my, my, my favorite of all time having on. I mean, you were just such an open book. You were so self-effacing and just so real and raw. And I just know that you helped thousands and thousands of people. And if, if people listening haven't heard his episode and don't, you know, they know your story probably if they're listening to this podcast, but I mean, the nitty gritty stuff that maybe you haven't told on this. I mean, you you went all out for us and, and uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was beautiful to hear. Well, I, I appreciate you, you guys. Yeah, let me tell the, the full story because there, there are definitely components to it that I do not talk about uh, on this show. Um, yeah. But you, you gave me an av uh, avenue to do that. So uh, super, super grateful for that. And you guys are just doing extraordinary things on that show with Switch for Good, the Eat Like an Olympian campaign. And you you just bring a whole bunch of good energy into the world too. So I could talk so to you, you all day, but like <laughs> we're, we're out of time for this one, but uh, standing invite, whenever you want to come back and just shoot the breeze. I mean, come on anytime. I love this no. so much. Thanks. I'm glad we got to do this right around the Olympic time and yeah, get people get people stoked about it's, it's going to be a it's going to be a fun couple of weeks of competition so no even with empty stands we'll be on our couches cheering really loud maybe they'll hear us <laughs> oh. <laughs> make the voices carry make yeah. them carry. <laughs> no. Dotsie Bausch, thank you so much for just being you